Good morning. Such a privilege and an honor to have those of you who are visiting with us this day. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, before we begin, let me mention one thing that was overlooked, and that was uh, the fact that last week, Melanie Register expressed her desire to become a part of our family here and placing her membership. So we welcome you and uh, look forward to working together with you. We've been studying through the book of Colossians. Today we will talk about Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 12. So I hope you have your, your Bibles with you, ready to, to turn and follow along with us. Have you ever had a feeling of emptiness, loneliness? I imagine that most of us have. Maybe some have it more than others. But I want you to know this day, friends, that you can feel that emptiness with the fullness of Christ. And that's what Jesus wants for each of us, to, to be filled with His fullness. Tennis star Boris Becker was at the very top of the tennis world, and yet he was on the brink of suicide. Imagine that. He said, I had won Wimbledon twice before, once as a young player. I was rich, he said. I had all the material possessions I needed. It's the old song of movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide. They have everything, and yet they are so unhappy. And so Boris says, I had no inner peace. I was a puppet on a string. You know, Becker is not the only one to feel that sensation of loneliness. The echoes of a hollow life pervade our culture. You don't have to, to read very many contemporary biographies to find the same amount of frustration and disappointment in the lives of very many people today. Jack Higgins, a, a famous author, once wrote a novel entitled The Eagle Has Landed. And in there, he was asked what he would have liked to have known as a boy. He simply answered the question this way, that when you get to the top, Nothing is there. Can you imagine all of these people who, according to the world's standards, have reached the top only to find that nothing is there? Only to find that there, there is still the sense of, of emptiness, a, a sense of need that has not been filled. And friends, I think you know this morning what is missing in their life is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only person that can fill that emptiness. Let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. Can you remember the day that you became a child of God? Do, do you vividly remember the emotion that was involved with that event? It was a time where we, we began to embark on the most important journey our life has ever known. A joy overwhelmed us to, to know that our sins had been covered with the blood of Christ. And being in Christ at that point, you feel a sense of power, a sense of purpose. You know, it's amazing to me that Christ has never failed us. Christ never promised us, on the one hand, that being a Christian would be easy. But what He did promise us is that He would never leave us and that He would never forsake us. That's Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. But no matter how long you have been a Christian, no matter how many years you study, it always seems like there is more to learn. And for a good reason, because that's the case. It always seems, no matter how old you get, and I hope this is true with you, I know it is with myself. No matter how old I get, it seems that I can always grow closer to Jesus. There's always room for improvement. You know, we're never going to make it to the top of Christianity as it were. No matter how good we may get at living the Christian life, 
There's always going to be room for improvement. No matter how close we grow to Jesus, there's always room to grow closer to Him. You see, Christianity is a lifestyle to be embraced, not an ideology to hold to. And so as Paul begins to speak to the Colossians here in chapter 2, he informs the Colossian brethren that they need to continue in the growth that they had experienced. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, Peter there reminds the churches in Galatia that they needed to do the same thing where he said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as Paul basically repeats the same thing, let's listen once again to what he tells the Colossian brethren. Colossians 2 beginning in verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, that is. Buried with Him in baptism in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. And you see here that he has an, a, a strong emphasis on continuing in that growth. So you're asking the question, how can we be filled then with His fullness? How can I replace that sense of emptiness with His fullness? Number one, I want you to notice the assurance that we embrace. In verses 6 and 7 there as we read, he talks about a certain assurance that a child of God has. Walking in Christ Jesus, being rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. That is an assurance that comes with Christianity. Now for the Colossians, as Paul is writing to them, their journey has just begun. And so he wants them to continually be reminded of it. But you see, to know that when I was living a life of sin, God still sent His Son to die for me. That's the assurance that I need. That's all that I need. To know that He loved me that much that when I was the one responsible for placing His Son on the cross, He still sent Him to die for me. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Paul points that fact out very clearly. He says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's what Christ did for us. He demonstrates His love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we read these metaphors here in Colossians chapter 2. Like being rooted in Christ... Being built up in Him? What is he talking about? Well, you're familiar with the word rooted. In the original language there, the, the, the word actually means to render firm. To fix or to establish. To cause a person or a thing to be thoroughly grounded. That's the word rooted. Built up is a word that means in fellowship with Christ to grow in spiritual life on the foundation laid by the apostles. So the idea that we have here is a tree. If you've ever tried to uproot a tree, certain kinds of trees anyways, you notice that they have a large tap root. And that tap root goes straight down into the ground as far as it can go. That's the picture that I get as I hear, hear Paul tell the Colossians to be rooted in Christ. Let your roots go straight down until you hit Christ. And that's how you can be firm and secure in this life. Once our, reach root, uh, once our roots reach Christ, then we find that He is the one who provides for us. 
He is the one who sustains our life. That's why Paul, as he was preaching to the men of Athens in Acts 17, says in verse 28, In Him we live and move and have our being. In Him because He sustains us, because He provides for us. And then once we are rooted in Him, we are being built up that large tree. Think about the largest tree you can imagine. And that's what Paul says the Colossians need to be. Built up on the foundation that the apostles had laid. And that was Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 15, that other foundation can no man lay than that which is already laid, Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. And so as we are building upon that rooted foundation, growing and building ourselves up in Christ, we begin to bear fruit. Just like trees do. The psalmist tells us how that happens. He says that it only happens when you meditate on the Word of God day and night. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, he shall prosper. That's a picture of what Paul is talking about here, where we let our roots grow deep and then where we build ourselves up in Christ. Once we come to that point in our Christian lives, we'll no longer have that feeling of emptiness. But He fills us and then there's no condemnation. That's what Paul said in in Romans 8 and verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So when we root ourselves and we build ourselves on that foundation, there's no condemnation. Peter puts it another way in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5 where he says that we are to come to Him as a living stone Rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So there he pictures a large building being erected on the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. The same idea applies. But the assurance we have is that once that happens, we don't have that emptiness anymore. Secondly, and quickly, I want you to notice with me the warning that we heed. If you notice in verse 8 of our text there in Colossians 2, Paul offers a warning to the Colossians. Beware, he says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Beware, Colossians. He's putting this large road sign out there in front of him, and he says, people are going to come to you, and they're going to try to cheat you out of your faith. That word rendered cheat there is a word that pictures someone who comes in and drags you away from it. To be led away as booty, if, it, if you will. To be seduced away from something. There are four things listed here that can do that. Philosophy. Vain deceit. Traditions of men. And the basic principles of the world. So Paul is telling the Colossians, you need to stay on constant alert. You think about those four categories listed that drag us away, that cheat us of our faith. And I guarantee just about every trial that you face in life will fall into one of those categories. Or it ties together in one way or another. That's because the devil uses anything he can to lure us away. He's trying to rot the roots of that tree that we are being built up as. You say, well, is philosophy bad in itself? Is it inherently evil? Absolutely not. Philosophy is an area of study that can enrich your life and deepen your thought process. 
But you see, so many times, philosophy goes against the Word of God. And when it does, that's when it's wrong. That's why we're told to resist the devil. Because of those four areas that drag us away from Christ, resist the devil, James says. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do you believe that? I'm pointing all of this out to you not because you don't already know it, but because we need to be reminded. Because we need to recognize what Satan tries to do to rot this tree. What he does to drag us away from Christ. Because friends, if we don't recognize it, we can't resist him. That's why Peter warns the brethren in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 to be sober and vigilant. Because our adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. And if we're not on constant guard, He will devour us. And He's going to drag us away from Christ. And so constantly we're warned over and over about how Satan works. Timothy, or or Paul actually warned Timothy of something that ties in quite nicely here with our text. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Basically, the whole chapter is given to it, but let's consider the first three verses. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, and so on and so forth. All of this ties together because these are other ways that Satan tries to cheat us, to seduce us and lure us away from Christ. So we need to heed that warning. Be on constant lookout. Number three, let's consider this emptiness that we're talking about. The emptiness that Christ fills. You know, to know what has been done for you by Christ should fill any emptiness you have. But, as it were, sometimes in life, things drag us down, and we begin to experience that feeling of emptiness. But you see, when you render obedience to the gospel of Christ, when you make Jesus the King of your life, the emptiness goes away. You're filled with His presence, knowing that He is there to help knowing that He's left His Spirit to be a helper and a comforter. In John 15, 26, He promised His disciples this comforter. He says, When the Comforter comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of Me. In other words, this Comforter, the Holy Spirit, is going to tell you that I am who I say I am. He's going to cement that idea or concrete it in your mind so Satan does never drag you away. Now, does the Spirit work miraculously today? I tend to believe no. Some may disagree with that. But I do know this. The Spirit works through the Word. The Spirit has left us the Word of God. And He guides us through it. And this is how we can uh, defeat the devil. (laughs) Once Jesus feels that emptiness then, He expects us to go and and proclaim that to others. To let others know that that they don't have to feel that sense of emptiness. That's where Matthew 5.16 comes into play. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's not necessarily always about telling them something. Sometimes it's better to show them. Show them how Christ has taken the emptiness out of your life. Now, in verse 8 there that we read, Paul says that we can be complete in Christ. That means to me that outside of Christ you cannot be complete. If we don't have that deep and abiding relationship with Him, we can't be complete and we're going to have that emptiness and the void that sometimes fills our life. 
Paul says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. One of those spiritual blessings indeed would be His fullness. That's Ephesians 1.3. You drop down to verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul says, In Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. You drop down to chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 17 through 19. He says he wants Christ to dwell in their hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What, Paul? How can I be filled with the fullness of God? By being rooted and grounded in love. By being rooted and grounded in the faith. That's how Christ fills our emptiness. And then when we wander away from God, when our relationship with Him begins to deteriorate, we're no longer rooted and we once again feel that emptiness. As long as we let Jesus in our heart day by day, one day we'll have that ultimate sense of fullness where it'll never be taken away. And the revelation John reveals for us in verse 15 through 17 of chapter 7, Therefore they are before the throne of God. They serve Him day and night in His temple. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Are you waiting for that ultimate fullness? Paul concludes this section by letting us know that there's a process by which all of this happens. Seems kind of backwards in a way. And I almost think, well, he, he should have started with the process. But I believe uh, it's a tool that he used to kind of pique their interest. How can you have that fullness? How can you let Christ dwell in you in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form? Well, look at verses 11 and 12. Because there he tells us the process. In Him, he says, you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Not a physical circumcision like Old Testament Israel. This is a spiritual circumcision. A circumcision of the heart where he says you put off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Once you put that body off, then you are buried with Him in baptism in which you also were raised with Him through the working of God who raised Him from the dead. And so this is the process by which we begin to be rooted and built up in Christ. The circumcision of the Old Testament was an outward expression of obedience. It was a sign that those people were accepting and coming into a covenant relationship with God. Here Paul says the same thing happens today in a little bit of a different way. It happens today through baptism. No, baptism is not an outward sign of an inward grace. No, not at all. But baptism, friends, is an outward sign of our obedience. It lets others know that we are ready to commence on this journey of being built up and rooted in Christ. To let them know that we are embarking in this covenant relationship with God. That we place our trust in Christ. That we surrender ourselves to be molded by the Word of God. And then, friends, once that happens, we experience the joy and the power of the Christian life. Did you ever wonder, as you're reading through the, the Acts, chapter 8, when we read about the eunuch, you get to the end of that account, and, and you read this, that Philip was caught away by the Spirit to Azotus, and the eunuch goes on his way rejoicing. Do you ever wonder why the eunuch goes on his way rejoicing? It's because he felt this joy. He felt this power and the sense of fullness 
that we're talking about this day. That's why Saul was able to, to begin his Christian life in such a powerful way. We won't read the text, but in Acts 9, verses 18 through 22, we read about how when he was baptized, that the, something, as it were, like scales fell from his eyes. And once he got some food in his, his system, he goes straight to work, preaching in the synagogues, teaching people. Why did he do that? Why couldn't he take just a little bit of time off to reflect on things? Well, it's because he wanted other people to know about it. He wanted others to know about this fullness and the joy that we experience as Christians. Friends, it's such an easy process that's difficult to master. Sounds kind of contradictory, but that's what the Christian life is. It's an easy process that's difficult to master. When Paul says that they should put off the sinful nature, he's not talking about something that is inherent in humans that causes them to sin. Most translations will add a footnote there. It says it should be translated flesh. That you put off the flesh. That's the idea. That's why Jesus said in Mark 14, 38, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So if you get rid of that flesh, if you get rid of the weakness, you're going to be able to successfully live the Christian life. But friends, in doing it, we need to strip it off completely. To remove that part of our life from our lives and to replace it with the Spirit of Christ. Have you let Christ fill your emptiness today? If not, what is filling that void? Are you letting money fill that emptiness? Work? Friends? Toys and gadgets? What is filling your emptiness today? If it's not Christ, whatever it is, is keeping you from Christ. Next week, we're going to consider how we can be free from failure. And as Paul builds upon this idea of baptism and circumcision, he wants the Christians to know that they can be free from that failure. But friends, today, if you need Christ to fill your emptiness... We've shown you how it happens. If you need assistance in that, let us know. If you need to respond to the invitation for any reason, whether to render obedience to the Gospel or for anything else, come now while we stand and sing.